Behind every brand is history, some filled with controversies more than others. One thing is certain, some try harder than others to cover up their dark past. Join us as we go on a journey to uncover the untold truth about one of the Caribbean's biggest brands. In 2018, the Jamaican Bobsleigh Federation announced it would be sending a female bobsleigh team to the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea. This was the first time Jamaica would send a female bobsleigh team to the Winter Olympics. 30 years after their male counterparts competed in Calgary, Canada. What you did not know was that they almost didn't compete due to an acrimonious falling out with the Federation, and the coach of the team who claimed that the sleigh belonged to her. This left the team's chances of competing very thin. But little did we know that aid would come from an unlikely source. Whom do you ask? From none other than one of the biggest brands in Jamaica's history, a beer company by the name of Red Stripe. The bobsleigh team went on to finish 19th place out of 20, but there was clearly one standout winner. That's Red Stripe, who boosted their already popular reputation when they offered to buy the team a new sleigh so that they could compete. This was just one of the many promotional campaigns from Red Stripe. But before they became the world's coolest beer let's go back to where it all began. To the men who started it all. This is the story of how Red Stripe rose to become one of the most recognized Caribbean brands. Our story starts back in 1918 on the island of Jamaica with two men by the names of Thomas Hargreaves Geddes and Eugene Donnells, both of British descent and entrepreneurs crossing paths. Born in 1880 to a Methodist minister by the name of Thomas Middleton Geddes and a mother, Rebecca Grace Geddes, Thomas Hargreaves Geddes attended a local high school called York Castle. Eugene Peter Donnells, according to sources, was born on July 29, 1878 to Peter Blaise Donos and Marie Isabel Malaber. Neither of the men's families was wealthy and therefore could not afford to send them overseas for an expensive education. It was at an organization called West Indies Mineral and Table Water Company that both men became acquaintances for the first time where Donos, working as a 12-year-old door opener, saw Geddes on his first day at work not knowing that their fateful encounter would create a fruitful partnership lasting for more than 79 years and giving birth to the world's coolest beer. Let us fast track a little into the future. After West Indies Minerals and Table Water Company both men were operating their aerated water companies. But it was when they combined forces in 1918 to form Donos and Geddes, or D&G as it was commonly called, that their fortunes started to change. See, their company started out producing aerated water, known as sodas today, along with distributing some very popular imported alcoholic beverages and liquors. Some sources even claim that they sold cola wine, an earlier version of Coca-Cola. Local cola wine producers would make all forms of outlandish medical claims about their products such as building and increasing red blood cells to strengthen digestion and increase brain cells. Donos and Geddes saw those claims as cliches instead they kept it simple by just claiming their cola wine was pleasant to the taste buds and affordable. Both gentlemen had big aspirations and in 1927 nine years after D&G was incorporated, they started their very own brewery in the capital Kingston called Surrey Brewery. A year later in 1928, they bottled their first beer. Paul Geddes was stopped by a policeman on the way home from work. Suddenly he remembered that earlier that day, someone had asked him what he would call the beer. As the policeman was checking his documents he pondered the question, and eventually came up with red stripe after seeing the red stripe on the side of the policeman's uniform. The version was far from the smooth taste to which the world today is accustomed. In fact, it was more of an ale than a lager and was considered by locals to taste too heavy for their liking. Nevertheless, this was a milestone not just for D&G but Jamaica's history. Paul Geddes the son of Thomas Geddes thought that the early version of the red stripe that his father and Eugene brewed was undrinkable and begged both men to let him try to improve it. Both men laughed at him but permitted him to try. So, he left for Brewmaster's school in Chicago with his sights set on becoming the first brewmaster of Jamaica. Despite the early hiccups the company faced, little did we know that Red Stripe Beer would go on to achieve far greater success worldwide. Let us tell you about what we considered to be the turning point in its history. In 1934, Paul, after meeting a German brewmaster by the name of Bill Martindale, would come up with a recipe, or buy the recipe, depending on which version you chose to follow, in Illinois to bring back home to Jamaica. This was a lager, a paler version, much smoother and suitable for the hot climatic conditions of Jamaica. Little did they know that it would be such a hit in just a year. This caused quite a controversy as the then governor would report back to England about the success of Red Stripe. This posed a threat to the very existence of the beer. Of course, back then, Jamaica had not yet gained independence and was still a colony of Britain. 
so the governors report back to London warning them of the local success of D&G distributing a beer at such high quality and at such an affordable price was seen as a threat to the English brands who would be unable to compete. The response from London was prompt. The intention was to tax local beers but not imports from Britain to ensure the British breweries would have the upper hand over D&G. The locals became infuriated and soon there was a public outcry. The powers to be would quietly withdraw the order. The battle was won by Red Stripe, but the war was far from over as we would later learn. Paul was on his own as those were tough and depressing times with the war, and according to sources Bill Martindale was taken away and imprisoned in a concentration camp. Despite various challenges and misfortune Paul, along with Peter Denos, the son of Eugene Denos, would take over the family business in 1938 with the aim of carrying on their father's legacy. This was a very tumultuous time in Jamaica's political history, with serious riots against unemployment, racial policies, and people showing resentment for the British rulers. The question was, could they steady the ship and ride out the storm? Let's find out. Remember earlier Red Stripe won the battle against British taxation. Well in 1940 the bloody Brits were back at it again. Only this time they were able to levy an excise tax on Red Stripe. But not just Red Stripe, the tax was levied against other goods as well, justified they said, by the ongoing war. Jamaica, like other nations, will have to pay its share of the cost of World War II. Little did they know that fate has a twisted sense of humor. See the same World War II would bring large allied troops from Canada and America to Jamaica's shores. Red Stripe sales skyrocketed as soldiers took a liking to its taste. This upturn gave the company the boost it needed to move on to the next phase in its operation, as in 1947 the company gained the franchise to bottle Pepsi Cola on the island. Things were getting quite cumbersome due to the rapid growth of the company so when Peter Denos became chairman in 1952 they already knew they had to expand the operations to match growing demands. In 1958, the Surrey Brewery was replaced by the present Red Stripe plant on Spanish Town Road which over the years became the ultra-modern plant we now know. The unrest on the island continued and by 1962 Jamaica gained independence from British rule leading to further consumption of Red Stripe. Not only because the people were celebrating, but the Red Stripe brand was one to which they could relate. Its past struggles and its ability to rise above adversities were so like the locals and their struggle with colonialism. A local columnist for the Daily Gleaner referred to the beer as far beyond colonial dependence and wrote, The real date of independence should have been 1928 when we established our self-respect and self-confidence through the production of a beer far beyond the capacity of mere colonial dependence. After years of trying to stop the rise of Red Stripe beer, fittingly one of the most significant contributions to the beer's popularity in the New World would come from one of Britain's prominent and fictional heroes when it was featured in Ian Fleming's James Bond Doctor No novel and film. Finally, the Brits did something good for Red Stripe. The next 30 years of the company's history will see Red Stripe going through an era of rapid expansion. With the most modern brewery in the Caribbean, Red Stripe has its eyes set on world domination and they had some of the most exciting and remarkable products such as Schweppes Tonic and Bitter Lemon, Heineken, Dragon Stout, 7-Up, Guinness, Ting, Malta, and Dandy Shandy. In 1967 D&G opened a new factory in Jamaica's second city Montego Bay to fulfill the local demand for soft drinks or what Americans call sodas. The company continues to ride the wave of success and by 1970 become publicly listed selling 8% of its shares on the local stock market. This culminated in earning $3 million for expansion and by the turn of the year earnings exceeded $20 million. This was big money by today's standards let alone back in 1970. Red Stripe Beer entered the UK market with a local brewer called Charles Wells. He made it under license and later distributed it to Italy and Spain as well. Even though this is a story about Red Stripe the truth is it owes some of its success to the contribution of another D&G product called Ting which was a soft drink made from local grapefruit plants. Ting was being exported to about 20 countries worldwide it too soon finds its way onto British shores and due to its success, D&G was able to improve the Red Stripe brand, but Red Stripe was not resting on their laurels and soon introduced a draft form, formulated with the same quality, strength, and specifications as the bottled version. This quickly helps them cement their position as one of Europe's fastest-growing premium lager beers with production moving from over 7,000 barrels to over 120,000 barrels annually. See one of the keys to Red Stripe's success was that it was marketed with this laid-back attitude synonymous with its country of origin. This experience is unusual to the Europeans who are accustomed to the hustle and bustle of fast-paced city life. 
things were looking good for DMG. From an unknown company in 1928 to embarking on a joint venture with Dutch brewers Heineken to brew their premium beer of the same name to employing over 1,200 employees, but Red Stripe was not finished as they were about to mount to greater heights. You cannot make the world's coolest beer without marketing, something Red Stripe over the years become very good at both locally and internationally. Remember earlier we mentioned Red Stripe's premiere in the James Bond franchise? It turns out this was only the start of their aggressive and quirky marketing strategies. Red Stripe's marketing strategies were designed and tailor-fitted according to their targeted region. For example, upon its entry into the British market Red Stripe quickly realized that its brand and music go hand in hand. Successful marketing is understanding the dynamics of people and seeing how best you can leverage these to get better results so when Red Stripe hit the British markets, they used old-fashioned barber pole style boxes with their logo across urban music menus in places such as Brixton, Bristol, and Birmingham. This type of branding was inexpensive plus when people leave these music festivals, they usually felt an association with the brand long after and ended up purchasing Red Stripe at the supermarkets and liquor stores to take home. Over the years Red Stripe's commitment to live and digital music in the United Kingdom has always been on showcase with their sponsorship of the Notting Hill Carnival, Camden Crawl Music Festival, and the Great Escape Music Festival. Perhaps you thought their run-in with the big screen was a fluke. This was far from the truth as over the years Red Stripe continued to pop up in popular films. In 1993 Red Stripe made its appearance in The Firm, a thriller-slash-drama starring leadman Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman resulting in a 90% increase in its sales. Red Stripe even made its way to television when it appeared in Season 2, Episode 6 of HBO's American sports drama series The Ballers starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson who was spotted drinking a bottle of Red Stripe in a pub scene. Speaking of America, Red Stripe was doing well in European countries such as the UK, Spain, Switzerland, and Sweden. They even made significant pushing of the brand in Australia but if Red Stripe was going to truly be a global brand, they would have to conquer the American market. In 2003 a massive advertising campaign was rolled out for the American audience featuring Doral Salmon with the tagline Hooray Beer, which was funny as the comedic twist saw Doral discussing the merits of a Red Stripe in quite a few amusing situations. Red Stripe's popularity has increased in North America, so Red Stripe was doing well internationally in terms of marketing but what about its local efforts? They were doing equally well locally, becoming the main sponsors of the nation's premier football league for the last 10 years. In the past Red Stripe even sponsored the nation's football team or reggae boys as they are famously called which made them the largest single sponsor of football in the Caribbean. Red Stripe is a well-known supporter of other sports as they invested 18 million in the National Cricket Championship. Perhaps the biggest cash Red Stripe may be put into marketing is its annual sponsorship of the world's biggest reggae festival known as Reggae Sumfest. The festival is known for not just bringing in some of the biggest local musical talents over the years, but also international talents as well, with famous acts such as Usher, Chris Brown, 50 Cent, and Alicia Keys. This is very good for the Jamaican economy as the Reggae Sumfest usually draws in herds of tourists from other countries around the world. In my opinion, the best piece of marketing was when they revert from the long neck bottles used internationally to the stubby bottles used in Jamaica as this associates the brand with its roots and allows its customers to identify with what they were accustomed to while visiting Jamaica. Red Stripe has done remarkably well at marketing considering the size of its competitors such as Budweiser, Corona, Heineken, Coors Light, Guinness, and Miller Lite. Red Stripe can go head to head with the competition, but marketing will get brands to the top. It seems controversies can plunge them to the bottom. Back in 1993 beverage giant Diageo which is known for popular brands such as Guinness and Johnny Walker acquired a 51% holding in Dino's and Get Is Limited, which means they own the Red Stripe brand. This saw the international distribution capabilities of Red Stripe increase enormously, but it came at the cost of some controversy. Back in 2015, a class action suit was filed against the manufacturers of Red Stripe beer in the United States stating that they used deceptive practices by pretending their beer was still being manufactured from Jamaica, even though they moved their production operations from Kingston to Pennsylvania in 2012. You might be thinking what's so controversial about this. Two plaintiffs represented by the law firm of Robbins Arroyo claimed that Diageo was selling Red Stripe at substantially higher prices than other local beers which not only gives them a marketing edge over their competitors, but is also unfair to their customers. To be fair to Red Stripe their bottle did state that it was manufactured and produced in Pennsylvania, but the plaintiffs believe it was too finely printed. 
even though both plaintiffs voluntarily dismissed their claims against the Red Stripe owners without prejudice and without disclosing their reason for doing so. In 2016 a federal judge dropped the case against Diageo US Incorporated, but the Red Stripe brand reputation was a little tarnished. Meanwhile back home Red Stripe had their fair share of lawsuits to deal with in 2011 an octogenarian farmer sued the company for negligence as he allegedly claims that he became ill after consuming a bottle of Red Stripe beer. In all honesty, I don't think you should be consuming beer at that age. Red Stripe quickly filed a countersuit demanding that the plaintiff put up 1 million as security for their cost in the lawsuit which was blocked by a Supreme Court and they challenged that the certificate for the lab test failed to point out the brand of beer and batch code printed on the bottle. Red Stripe stated that the chemicals found in the same lab test are neither stored nor used by them. Both parties ended up resolving the issue and at the time of the making of this video, the terms of the settlement were still undisclosed. This is when things get a bit interesting, pun intended. Remember earlier I mentioned another one of D&G's popular brands called Ting. It turns out that in 1985 D&G started mass exportation to the United States targeting communities with large Caribbean contingents. The company continues to do this for a number of years well into its newly acquired ownership by Guinness failing to register the trademark in the United States. Several years later they were hit with a trademark infringement lawsuit from Kraft General Foods who owned the Tang brand of drink mix. Yes, that same Tang that was popular for going into space with the astronaut. This was a well-learned lesson for the owner as they ensured all future file trademark patents in the United States for products such as Malta were not taken lightly. However, one of the strangest controversies to ever come out of Red Stripe is maybe one you never heard about concerning the company Air Paul H. Geddes. Before the stakes of the company were sold, he was subject to one of the first palimony suits. Paul ended up leaving his longtime lover Helga Stokert for a much younger Margie who later became his wife. This left Helga feeling betrayed filing a claim for 14 million Jamaican dollars in 1993. Poor Helga ended up in a court battle that lasted for years from Jamaica's Supreme Court to the United Kingdom's Privy Council. She eventually lost. Paul H. Geddes died in 1999 at the age of 89 leaving his estate worth 600 million Jamaican dollars to his widow Margie. Over the years Red Stripe has made a lot of innovations to ensure the brand remains competitive, and even when it's down to big decisions the company usually gets it right. 1999 saw D&G sell out their wine and spirits brands to Ray and Nephew so that they could focus solely on brewing only Red Stripe beer. They then realized how competitive the local soda markets were getting so they made the decision to sell this arm of the business to Pepsi Cola for about 25 million. Red Stripe then launches initiatives to source more local raw materials to be used in their production by partnering with local farmers. This culminated in them using locally grown cassava as a starch source in their beers rather than only relying on imports. They get to cut their import costs and meet their green goals. Speaking about green goals, the company managed to reduce its carbon footprint and greenhouse emissions significantly by switching its plant's main fuel source from oil to liquefied natural gas. Red Stripe even recognized that even though the brand's history is rich there is still a need to tap into new markets, to put forward new products which saw them launching Red Stripe Light and Red Stripe Flavored Beer which saw them roll out a host of exotic and tropical flavors such as lemon, sorrel, melon, and apple. This widens their appeal to a younger customer base. They even launched Cannes' version of their historic lager. Perhaps the single most significant revamp saw them changing their name from D&G to Simple Red Stripe as this allows them to work with the slogan the world's coolest beer. By the time Heineken took over majority ownership in Red Stripe, they continue the brand overhaul process as they move back most of their production back to Jamaica allowing the brand to be re-identified with all things Jamaican. If you have enjoyed this video, please be free to smash the like button as it would really help out our channel. And if you are interested in hearing the story of the man who reinvented all-inclusive luxury hotels be sure to watch our video on Gordon Butch Stewart. We will see you there. Be safe until next time.